As we resume this afternoon, let's uh, take just a moment and bow together. Our Father, again, as we come to the final session today, we thank you for the kindness that you have been showing to us in each session. We thank you for the things that have been learned. We thank you for the questions that have been asked. We thank you for the challenges that are set before us in terms of becoming helpers to your people and servants to our God. We pray that you would be with us as we talk about this last topic today. Uh, Give us insight, give us understanding, give us comfort, give us courage, the courage of your people, we pray, through Jesus Christ, our Savior. Amen. Our topic this afternoon is how to comfort the dying. And as we have the other sessions, there are some key verses I want us to keep in mind. There are several key verses today. Ecclesiastes 9, 5, and 6, for the living know that they will die, but the dead know nothing. They have no further reward, and even the memory of them is forgotten. Their love, their hate, And their jealousy have long since vanished. Never again will they have a part in anything that happens under the sun. Job 30, I know you will bring bring me down to death, to the place appointed for all the living. Psalm 89, what man can live and not see death? or save himself from the power of the grave. And Ecclesiastes 8, no man has power over the wind, or that could be translated over his spirit to contain it. So no one has power over the day of his death. The living know they will die. That's how Ecclesiastes 9, 5 begins. And we know it's true. The question that I'm often asked is, why must people die? When I am called out to a death scene, I will be asked that question. When I make a death notification, I'm sometimes asked that question. When I'm meeting with a family in the room of somebody who is dying, that question may come up. And we should have answers for that question. We have to be careful in how we get into it. We need to be sensitive to the emotional context in which we're speaking, but we have answers. And when the question is asked, we should at least think ourselves about the answer and find a way to communicate it. Why must they die? Because, first of all, We are all sinners. God created man to live. In Genesis, God formed man out of the dust of the ground and he breathed into man the breath of life and the man became what? A living being. We are created to live. Death was threatened as a penalty for sin in Genesis chapter 2. And death entered the world through sin, Paul says in Romans chapter 5. On the day that Adam and Eve sinned against God, on the day that they bought into the lie of the devil and aligned themselves with him in opposition to God who created them, on that day, Adam and Eve died spiritually. They were dead with reference to God. They experienced spiritual alienation from God. They came under the curse. They experienced banishment from Eden. And they experienced the beginning of the process of physical corruption leading to death. From that, we need to understand that death, therefore, is not natural. It's a consequence 
of sin. <clears throat> How many times do you hear people comforting each other? It's, it's natural. It's, it's a natural process. Or you go to a, an opportunity to view the deceased individual and they say, oh, she looks so natural. Yeah, her lips are always glued together, right? It, it's, not, it's not real. But we try to minimize the, the harshness of death by making it pretty. It's natural. We put all kinds of flowers around. Oh, it's so beautiful, a beautiful service, all of those kinds of things. But the reality is it's a harsh reality that people must die and that they must die as a consequence of sin. In Romans 5, Paul says, death came to all men because all sinned. When we look at the, when we think about the genealogies in the Old Testament, most people think in terms of the begats, right? So-and-so begat somebody, so-and-so begat somebody, so-and-so begat somebody. But that's not the point of the genealogies. There is a value in that. But all of those genealogies come to the point, and he died, and he died, and he died. The genealogies talk about life. They also talk about the reality and the universality of death as a consequence of sin. We must die because of sin. Secondly, we must die because God is just and death is his judgment. If God threatened death in the garden to Adam and Eve for disobeying and did not follow through, what would that make God? A liar. And God is not a liar. God is truth. So God is just, and death is his judgment. It is appointed unto man to die once, and after this comes judgment, Hebrews 9.27. I think it's important to understand that the time of your death is determined by God. Job says man's days are determined. You have decreed the number of his months and have set limits he cannot exceed. Now, we commonly talk about somebody having a premature death or we talk about somebody cheating death and those kinds of things, and we recognize God's providences in those things, but what man has power to extend his life? Not one. What man has power to prevent death from overtaking him. Not one. These things are not in our hands. These things are in God's hands. And we need to recognize that and to give glory to God. All the days ordained for me, Psalm 139 says, were written in your book before one of them came to be. And I think we need to go further and need to recognize that not only the time, but even the manner of your death, the way in which you will die, is determined by God. Do you remember that, uh, that Peter, when Jesus was arrested, denied him three times? He said, I don't know him. I'm, I'm not with him. And then after Jesus rose from the dead, there's that scripture at the end of John's gospel where Jesus restores Peter to his ministry uh, three times. The, the whole questioning, do you love me? Do you love me? And Peter responds using a different word than Jesus used, a, a lesser kind of love. I love you this way. I'm not implying, I'm not sure I love you at this level. Lord, look what I did. But Jesus restores him. And in that context, Jesus says to Peter, I tell you the truth, John 21. When you were younger, you dressed yourself and went where you wanted. But when you are old, 
you will stretch out your hands and someone else will dress you and lead you where you do not want to go. Jesus said this to indicate the kind of death by which Peter would glorify God. Peter glorified God in the manner of his death by being crucified. And tradition tells us that he would not allow himself to be crucified in the same way that Jesus was, and so he was crucified upside down. But the point here is that Jesus is telling Peter, when you die, this is how it's going to be. Somebody else is going to dress you. They're going to lead you to where you do not want to go, to the place of execution. That's appointed by God. Peter looked around and said, what about him? Talking about John. What about him? And Jesus said that, what's that to you, basically? He's my servant. I'll do what I want with my servant. And what does it matter to you if he, if he goes on living? And from that sprang a rumor that John was trying to correct that that apostle John would never die because Jesus didn't tell Peter how he would die. But the point is, and the thing we need to take away from it, is that the manner of our death is also determined by God. There are all kinds of causes of death. Some of us will die of cancer. Did God appoint that? Yes, he did. Some of us will die in a traffic accident. Some may die in a plane crash. Some may die of cardiac arrest. Some may die of a pulmonary embolism. Some may die of a stroke. Some may die of kidney disease, chronic disease. All kinds of things. But all of these things are under the sovereignty of God. You look at that word sovereignty, and you see, you should see two words. If you take the, the S, take the word sovereign, and move the S around to the back. I guess it would be this direction for you. Move it to the back, and it says reigns over. That's what sovereign means, to reign over. God reigns. God rules over everything. The scripture tells us, and we believe, that not a bird can fall from heaven apart from the Father's will. The scripture tells us, and we believe, that not a hair can fall from our head apart from the Lord. He counts the hairs on our head. Do we really think that these major diseases and these major incidents are outside the scope of God's ability to control? He is in charge. And the time and the manner of our death is appointed. But note, he tells Peter, the manner, the means of death by which he will glorify God. We are to glorify God through whatever means he has appointed for our death. If it's cancer, then we have a field of opportunity to witness to people in the hospital, in the treatment centers, wherever it may be. That's the idea. But why must they die? Another reason is because we must be changed to enter heaven. Paul says in 2 Corinthians, Meanwhile, we groan, longing to be clothed with our heavenly dwelling, because when we are clothed, we will not be found naked. For while we are in this tent, we groan and are burdened, because we do not wish to be unclothed, but to be clothed with our heavenly dwelling, so that what is mortal may be swallowed up by life. Now it is God who has made us for this very purpose. Death is a transition for the believer, a transition from one form of life to another form of life, from temporal life under the sun to eternal life in the presence of our God. Now, who must die? The wicked must die. The evildoers must die. Sinners must die. And the righteous, believers, must die. 
all men of all time and all places. Solomon says in Ecclesiastes 9 that all share a common destiny, the righteous and the wicked, the good and the bad, the clean and the unclean, those who offer sacrifices and those who do not. The same destiny overtakes all. The death rate is 100%. Don't think that you will be an exception. Enoch was an exception in Hebrews 11, and those who are alive at Christ's return will be an exception. They will, we will not all sleep, Paul says, but these are the exceptions. Don't take it for granted that you somehow are going to escape what has been appointed for all men of all time and all places. And when we talk about people dying, don't think only of those who appear to be on their deathbed. Richard Baxter said, I preached as never sure to preach again and as a dying man to dying men. His point, we all bear the seeds of our own destruction within. Some of us right now have the origins of a disease that may take our life. We don't know when. We don't know how. It could be today. It could be tomorrow. It could be sitting right where you are right now. I hope not, because that would not be good in a seminar on out of comfort for dying. But truly, we are all one heartbeat away. Just over a week ago, I was called out to a local police department as part of a critical incident stress management team to meet with the officers from the department because a much-loved sergeant was found dead in his home. The investigators ruled out foul play. They ruled out suicide. We're waiting for the autopsy reports to be completely certain, but everything points to natural causes. The amazing thing is this sergeant who's been a police officer for probably 20 years, everybody who knew him loved him. He was 42 years of age, top physical health trainer, motorcycle cop, uh, the whole the whole bit. The day before, he had led an active shooter training and showed no signs of anything. So we're thinking it could have been sudden cardiac arrest. It could have been a pulmonary embolism. It could have been a number of things. But the point is, this is not a man you would expect to die. But he did. Suddenly, finally, without any warning. And that's what happens. One home I went to, the man was getting ready to go to a cardiac appointment, to a cardiologist appointment. He was shaving, had the bathroom door open, talking to his wife, who was in another room. And suddenly she realized he stopped talking. He was on the floor, and he would, they were not able to resuscitate him. You don't expect that. But that's sometimes how death comes. What do people who know they're facing death fear? Let me suggest some things I've talked to people about that I find that are on, it's on their mind. One is the aftermath of dying. Some people tell me, I'm not afraid of dying. I'm not afraid of death. I, I know I'll be with the Lord. But there is that fear of what will happen to me. And in the case of, of some people, they don't know that they'll be with the Lord. What will happen to me when I die? Francis Bacon said that men fear death as children fear the dark. Why do children fear the dark? They, they do tend to fear the dark. Why do they fear the dark? Unknown, unseen, monsters under the bed, monsters in the closet. 
they can't see it, they, they're, they're scared. And some people we, we don't know. Now, as believers, we know what the scripture says, but some people fear what's going to happen. They don't know what's going to happen, even though the scripture tells them. They fear death as children fear the dark. Bildad the Shuite in Job said that he is torn from the security of his tent and marched off to the king of terrors. Um, the security of his tent. Where is a safe place for us, usually? Home. They think of home as a safe place. Danger is out there. Danger is in the world. Large number of deaths occur at home. Natural deaths and accidental deaths at home. You fall off a ladder. You fall out of a tree. You fall down the stairs. You shock yourself doing something electrical. These things all occur in a safe place, and you are ripped from that safe place suddenly and irrevocably to confront the king of terrors. Solomon says in Ecclesiastes, and the dust returns to the ground it came from, and the spirit returns to God who gave it. For God will bring every deed into judgment, including every hidden thing, whether it is good or evil. We understand this is a very, really a, a simple definition of death. It's a separation of soul from body. The soul returns to God who created it, who gave it, and the dust returns to the ground it came from. At that point, we are what we call dead. What do people fear about death? Hebrews 2 says, since the children have flesh and blood, he too shared in their humanity so that by his death, he might destroy him who holds the power of death, that is the devil, and free those who all their lives were held in slavery by their fear of death. People go through life fearing death. They're afraid, and that inhibits them, that restricts them, that keeps them from doing many things that they could and should do. People are afraid of the changes that accompany dying. When somebody receives a, 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 a terminal diagnosis, they will begin thinking about the last trip that they'll go on. Somebody might ask them, is this your last big trip? The last day at work? The last dinner out? All those last things are things that concern them and that may bring tears to their eyes. The question, will I become a burden to my family? Nobody wants to be a burden. That becomes a very big concern to people who face the reality that death is approaching. They're afraid of the experience of dying. I'm not afraid of death in the sense I know where I'll be, but going through that transition, what will that be like? Will it be painful? Will it be prolonged? Can I be at home? Will I die alone? We go back to the first night, the, the big fear that people have of being alone. Will my faith fail? Will I be able to, to persevere to the end? Will I hold up? These are questions that people are asking themselves. Solomon says, remember your creator in the days of your youth, before the days of trouble come and the years approach when you will say, I find no pleasure in them. In the book of Ecclesiastes, while it is rarely read by young people, I, I find it interesting it is written for young people. That's the point of the book. Solomon goes through all these different 
uh, visions of what life can be, all of these things that promise pleasure and promise success and promise a, an accomplishment, and he discounts them one by one, throws them to the side, and he comes to the end of the book, and here's the conclusion of the whole thing, fear God. Fear God in your youth. While you're young, remember your creator. Before the days come, the days of trouble, when you'll say, I find no pleasure in them. We need to preach this book to our kids. We need to preach this book to our young people. The problem is, in many times, the, 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 the book is so long that people get lost in it. They don't read it all the way through. It's best if you can read Ecclesiastes in one setting. So you get the full impact and come down to that 12th chapter that is so, so very vital. What do people fear? They fear the disarray of dying. The loose ends. The broken relationships. The estranged family members that you would like to be reconciled with before you die, or, or at the other end, the estranged son who would like to be reconciled to mom or dad before they die. The responsibilities that can't be completed, or you're afraid won't be completed. They fear the need, it's on their mind, it's a burden, the need to put their house in order. To have the, the legal documents prepared, the will, the power of attorney, the advance directive or do not resuscitate orders, and, and those things that are end-of-life documents. It's messy if those things aren't in place. And yet, nobody really looks forward to writing those kinds of documents. It's a problem and something that is causing anxiety in people who know that they are dying. They fear the consequences to others of their dying. What will happen to my spouse? What will happen to my children, my friends? What will happen to my employees and my coworkers? What will the financial impact on my family be? How, how should I be taken care of? What are our funeral plans that we should make? The cost of a funeral is the cost of a car in some cases. It's, it's very expensive. What should we do? How should we do it? And then the question, should I consider speeding up the process or committing suicide? Especially if the diagnosis is of a terminal illness or a chronic illness or injury. The uh, New, New England Journal of Medicine did an article a few years back on the critical two weeks following a diagnosis of a terminal disease. That's the most dangerous period for somebody with that kind of diagnosis to end their life. And with physician-assisted suicide and those things available, People often run to that. They don't ask the counsel of the family. Some do, I'm sure. But often they just take it into their own hands and they do it. Should I do that so that I'm not a burden? Another fear, another thing that's on people's minds is the fear of being forgotten. Forgotten. Solomon says, for the wise man, like the fool, will not be long remembered. In days to come, both will be forgotten. Like the fool, the wise man, too, must die. And we want to leave a legacy. We want to leave something that will cause us to be remembered, at least for a while. What, what legacy will I leave to my children? And sometimes people look at the the fruit of their lives, the, the accomplishments of their hard work, has all my hard work only been in vain? Solomon, again, I hated all the things I had toiled for under the sun, 
because I must leave them to the one who comes after me. And who knows whether he will be a wise man or a fool. Yet he will have control over all the work into which I've poured my effort and still under the sun. What's going to happen to the business I've built? What's going to happen to the ministry I've had in my church? What's going to happen to the circle of friends that I have when I'm gone? How quickly will the work I've done fade away? How quickly will it pass to somebody else and be no more? How can you comfort people who are dying, who have all of these concerns and more? Well, I want to remind you, Romans 15, you have what you need to comfort others. Paul says, I myself am convinced, my brothers, that you yourselves are full of goodness, complete in knowledge, and competent to instruct or to counsel one another. You have what you need. You have the necessary character. As a believer, <coughs> excuse me, As a believer, you have been and are being transformed by the Spirit of God. You have the Spirit of God within you. You have the goodness to cause you to reach out and to come alongside others to help them. You have the necessary tools. Paul says you are complete in knowledge. Now, what does he mean by that? Do we have all the answers? No. Do we have... All knowledge? Does any of us know everything about everything? No. What do we have? We have the Word of God. This is our greatest tool. We don't know everything, but the one who caused this book to be written does. We don't understand everything, but the one whose spirit worked in the apostles and prophets to write scripture does. We have this tool to which we can turn and find the answers that we seek. We might come along somebody and we have to say, I don't know the answers to that, but I'll search. I'll look into the scriptures. I'll see if I can find the answer for you. You have what you need to instruct one another. The NIV says to counsel one another. Some versions read, the word used here to instruct or to counsel is the Greek verb nutheteo, from which we get the idea of nuthetic counseling. Now it's called biblical counseling, but for many years it went under the label nuthetic counseling. And the word, the verb nutheteo in the Greek meant to confront somebody with a view toward bringing about desirable change in their lives. That's what we do. That's what we're able to do. Paul says with the right character, with the right tool, the scripture, the knowledge of God, you are equipped to do that. You can talk to people with a view toward bringing about desirable change in their lives. You have the necessary experience to comfort people who are dying. In 2 Corinthians, Paul says, Praise be to the God and Father of our Lord Jesus Christ, the Father of our excuse me, the Father of our Lord Jesus Christ, the Father of compassion and the God of all comfort, who comforts us in all our troubles so that we can comfort those in any trouble with the comfort we ourselves have received from God. We take our experience of being comforted and with the comfort with which God comforts us, we can then go into the presence of others and bring that very same comfort to them. That's the idea. God equips us by bringing us through trials and tribulations and afflictions and difficulties and horrendous experiences. He shows himself to us. He reveals himself in his patience, in his, in his compassion, and we then can turn around and be a benefit to others. You are able. Are you willing? 
Who will comfort the dying? Would you say, as Isaiah said, send me? How can you comfort the dying? You can pray. Pray for needed grace at the time of need. Archibald Alexander, in Thoughts on Religious Experiences, wrote, In all my life, I've known few persons who lived like Christians when in health, who did not, in their approach to death, manifest as much hope and fortitude in that trying hour as could reasonably have been expected from the character of their piety. In general, the result of my observations is that the pious find death less terrible on their near approach to the event than when it was viewed at a distance. Death is more frightening from a distance than it is as you approach it. Needed grace in the time of need. When I was a young man, I would read Christian biography. I would read about martyrs and others who, who died for the faith. And I would wonder, do I have that kind of faith? If I were put in those circumstances, would I profess to the end? Would I be a faithful witness and testimony? And that bothered me. Because I wasn't, I wasn't at all confident that I would. I thought I might buckle under the pressure. But I realized at some point that God gives us grace, not in advance, to put in the bank. He gives us grace at the hour that we need it. And that's what those martyrs found. They probably were concerned the same way I was concerned. If the moment comes, if I'm put to trial, will I stand fast in the faith? And they found God to be faithful. So that, in fact, they did. And now my confidence is not in knowing that, oh, my faith is robust and I know I can withstand it. My faith is in knowing that God, who is gracious, will give me grace at the time that I need it and not before. So when people are, are struggling with these issues, you can give them that assurance. God will be with you. God will give you grace. All the grace that you require at the time that you require it. Pray for wisdom for the caregivers and the family about treatments concerning, or excuse me, about decisions concerning treatment. Pray for a clear mind and a spiritual conversation. There's no need to suffer needlessly. But if possible, when the time comes, encourage the use of pain medications that will keep the mind clear for as long as possible. Many in the health profession, they don't want people to suffer. So they give them doses of medication that basically just blur them. They become unresponsive. They say they're not feeling anything, but they also can't communicate anything. If you can have a pain medication that will keep your mind clear, as clear as possible, as long as possible, that can be a fruitful time. A cloudy mind hinders both the opportunity to be ministered unto and the opportunity to minister to others. Pray for the presence of God. And Psalm 23 says, even though I walk through the valley of the shadow of death, I will fear no evil, for you are with me. Your rod and your staff, they are the symbols of your presence. They comfort me. Pray for healing, but keep in mind that God's presence is greater even than healing. Peter Jeffrey, in a book titled Sickness and Death in the Christian Family, said it is possible to be satisfied with God's presence and not need to look for his power to heal. On his deathbed, Dr. Lloyd-Jones wrote on a scrap of paper for his family, do not pray for healing. Do not hold me back from glory. We had 
a dear lady who was the organist in our church for many years. And as she grew older, she grew infirm. She was in a, a, um, a nursing home. And I would go to visit her. And every time I went to visit her, she would ask me to pray, not for healing. She would ask me to pray for the Lord to bring her home. Her attitude was, I can't wait for the Lord to bring me home. Why does he leave me here? Most of us would, you know, we're, why would you take us, Lord? She's, why would he leave me here? My work is finished. Lord, take me home. I'm ready. Take me. We can minister in that context. How can you comfort the dying? Go. Go. It's an active verb. It's something for you to do, something you can do. James says, religion that God our Father accepts as pure and faultless is this, to look after orphans and widows in their distress and to keep oneself from being polluted by the world. In their distress. Other versions render it in their affliction. And I think the language there is very specific and very important. It's fine to have ministry to people after their affliction. But James says, go to people in their affliction. And this pertains especially to people who are dying. Go to them while they're dying. It's nice to have a nice service and say nice things about them afterwards. Go to them while they're going through this experience. Go and sit by them. Go and talk with them. Go and pray with them. And take others with you whenever possible. And don't be afraid to bring children into the presence of someone who's dying. Our culture has shielded people from death in a way that I believe is harmful. I'm amazed when I'm called out to a scene and I'm talking to people who are in their 40s and 50s who are just beside themselves because they said they have never seen a dead body. They've never seen a dead body. In the whole course of growing up, you never had someone in your family. You, no, we didn't go to the funeral. Mom wouldn't let us. They, our parents shielded us. and They've never seen a dead body. Take people with you. Bring children with you so that they understand. Don't tell them Grandma went on a vacation and didn't come back. Let them be part of this whole experience. Many people want to go visit, <clears throat> but the truth is they don't know what to say. They don't know what to do. Soon after I came to the church at Juanita in Kirkland, Washington, we had a, a man who was a I saw him as a potential deacon in the church. He was a great guy, godly man. And one morning, his daughter got up and found him still in his chair with the TV on. She just figured he had fallen asleep watching the TV. That was, he, he stayed up late watching TV. It was unusual for him to fall asleep watching TV, but she just figured that's what he did. She went out in the kitchen and made herself breakfast, and then she came back, and he was still there, and she shook him and realized he's cold to the touch. She called 911, and units responded, but there was nothing they could do. He had, he was not, well, it's, let me back up. He had not died. They were able to deal with him. He had, they discovered that he had brain cancer, inoperable brain cancer. So he was given a diagnosis he was going to die. And I went and visited with him, and initially we could do some things together. We could play a little chess or something, and, and we could read scripture, and we could pray, and I encouraged others to go. I announced it, go visit with John, make sure you go see John. 
And then John died. And I learned that the only one who came to visit him was me. That disturbed me, and my disturbance came out. <laughs> and, and I kind of chastised the people for not doing what they had been told and encouraged to do. We had Sunday school after the morning service, and Sunday school was a discussion of the morning sermon. So one of the guys spoke up, and he said how terrible he felt that he didn't go. He was one of the ones that didn't go. He felt like he should have gone, but he didn't. And, and he, he said to me, Pastor, we didn't, we didn't know what to do if we went. We didn't know what to say if we went. And I realized, came crashing in, that was my fault. See, as a pastor, I'm to equip them. I told them to do it, but I didn't give them the equipment to do it with. And I realized that I should have invited somebody to go with me, a different person. Each time that I went, I should have invited somebody else to go with me so that they could sit and learn and listen and know there's nothing magical, there's nothing mystical. It's a matter of coming and offering encouragement through the reading of the word and praying. And you can do that. So go. Go. And when you go, listen. Listen. Listening is a large part of counseling, isn't it? Dying people need and want to talk about what is happening in them physically and spiritually. You know what prevents them? The family. Family members often won't let them talk about the things that they most want to talk about. The family doesn't want them to talk about dying because they're afraid that it will depress them and hasten their death. They may be in denial themselves. We don't want to look at this. We don't want to believe this. We need to encourage family members to let their dying loved ones speak freely. And if they think they're going to have a problem with that, offer to be with them, to be there if needed. Listen to what people are telling you about their experience and don't presume to know what they are feeling. And then you need to talk. Bring the scripture to bear. Bring words of encouragement. And don't be afraid of purposeful silence. You remember the early chapters of Job, all the things that happened to him. He lost his herds. His kids were killed. His health was broken. Even his wife told him to curse God and die. All of these things came crowding down on him. And Job had friends that came to comfort him. We preachers often um, joke about Job's comforters. It's kind of uh, proverbial that they were not very comforting. And in truth, in the things that they said, they weren't very comforting. They all kind of had different... Uh, uh, different ways of expressing it, but kind of the, the same idea. Job, what did you do to deserve all this? You did something. You did something to tick off God. What was it? Come clean. Confess it. And Job's, I don't know. I didn't do anything. I can't think. I'm not a perfect man, but I can't think of anything. Job said, I am a righteous man. Some, some make a, a big deal about that as if he is being self-righteous. I don't think he's being self-righteous. I think he's being honest. I don't see anything in my life that I've done that would cause uh, these things to befall me. I'm a righteous man, and the righteous shall live by faith. He's justified by faith. But when Job's friends initially came, the scripture says in Job chapter 2 that they heard about all the troubles that had come upon him. 
And Job's three friends set out from their homes and met together by agreement to go and sympathize with him and comfort him. When they saw him from a distance, they could hardly recognize him. They began to weep aloud, and they tore their robes, a sign of mourning, and sprinkled dust on their heads. Then they sat on the ground with him for seven days and seven nights. No one said a word to him because they saw how great his suffering was. Now, I think when we cast Job's comforters as in a bad light, I think we're missing the point here. These are good friends. They heard about it. They didn't send him a sympathy card. They came in person with some difficulty at some expense. When they saw him, they shared with him in his suffering. They tore their clothes. They put dust on their heads. They wept with him. And then when they came into his presence, they sat on the ground with him for seven days and seven nights. They didn't say anything. There weren't words to say. He wasn't ready to hear words anyway. They just sat with him. Now think about it. Do you have any friends who would come and just be with you through a terrible trial for seven days and seven nights? Just sit with you. Just be with you. Sometimes silence is sufficient. It's just the fact that you're there that has meaning to that person. How can you comfort the dying? This is a recurring theme, isn't it? Dying people need what? They need hope. And hope comes from the God of hope. Through the scripture, by the power of the Holy Spirit. We've looked at these passages in Romans 15. Psalm 23 is a very comforting psalm. It's familiar, but its very familiarity adds to the comfort. The Lord is my shepherd. I'll not be in want. And all that that follows. What a, a blessing to have this text. This is why it's often a text that is read or preached upon in funeral services. It's also very good to use in the hospital room or the hospice room or at the bedside. A passage I love to use is Isaiah chapter 43, verses 1 to 7. Now this is what the Lord says, He who created you, O Jacob, He who formed you, O Israel. Fear not, for I have redeemed you. I have summoned you by name. You are mine. When you pass through the waters, I'll be with you. When you pass through the rivers, they'll not sweep over you. When you walk through the fire, you will not be burned. The flames will not set you ablaze. You catch what he's saying here. It's not, I will deliver you from these things. Don't worry about it. The flames never going to touch you. You're not going to, the waters won't overwhelm you. It's, I'll go through it with you. I'll be there with you. For I am the Lord, your God, the Holy One of Israel, your Savior. I give Egypt for your ransom, Cush and Seba in your stead, since you are precious and honored in my sight and because I love you. I will give men in exchange for you and people in exchange for your life. Don't be afraid. I am with you. I'll bring your children from the east and gather you from the west. I'll say to the north, give them up, and to the south, do not hold them back. Bring my sons from afar and my daughters from the ends of the earth. Everyone who is called by my name whom I created for my glory, whom I formed and made. Now, Isaiah is primarily speaking uh, to the people of Judah. I realize that. But I'm also called by his name. I was also created for his glory. God formed and made me for him. And I think the things that he says here about being with me, about loving me, these are true of me as well. They're true for all the people of God. What what comforting verses, scriptures like these are. Archibald Alexander said that one simple declaration of the word of God 
is worth more to a soul descending into the valley and shadow of death than all the ingenious and vivid imaginings of the brightest human minds. Just read scripture with people and it will comfort and encourage them and give them hope. Hope comes too from good hymns. Good hymns. I'm not going to sing them. But uh, are you familiar with the hymn, Whate'er My God Ordains Is Right, by Samuel Rodegast? Is that familiar? Listen, listen to the language. Samuel Rodegast was a, a German believer who wrote this hymn to encourage a sick friend. He took it seriously. I'm going to go to the sick bed. I'm going to visit my friend. I want to bring something to him. He wrote this hymn. Whate'er. That is whatever. Whatever my God ordains is right. His holy will abideth. I will be still whate'er he doth and follow where he guideth. He is my God. Though dark my road, he holds me that I shall not fall. Wherefore to him I leave it all. Whatever my God ordains is right. He never will deceive me. He leads me by the proper path. I know he will not leave me. I take content what he hath sent. His hand can turn my griefs away, and patiently I wait his day. Whatever my God ordains is right, though now this cup in drinking may bitter seem to my faint heart, I take it all unshrinking. My God is true, each morn anew, Sweet comfort yet shall fill my heart, and pain and sorrow shall depart. Whatever my God ordains is right, here shall my stand be taken. Though sorrow, need, or death be mine, yet am I not forsaken. My Father's care is round me there. He holds me that I shall not fall, and so to Him I leave it all. Isn't that beautiful? Here's another a great hymn. I, I make copies of this sometimes and leave it with the people that I go to. Are you familiar with The Sands of Time Are Sinking? Is that familiar? A few people? It's a hymn by Anne Cousin, who was a Scottish Presbyterian pastor's wife. The tune is Rutherford. And the poem was originally titled, The Last Words of Samuel Rutherford. It's drawn from his writings and then adapted. The sands of time are sinking. By the way, any Spurgeon uh, fans here? Charles Spurgeon? This was the last hymn that Spurgeon announced at a worship service. And it was sung at his funeral. The sands of time are sinking. The dawn of heaven breaks. The summer morn I've sighed for, the fair sweet morn awakes. Dark, dark hath been the midnight, but day spring is at hand, and glory, glory dwelleth in Emmanuel's land. The king there in his beauty without a veil is seen. It were a well-spent journey, though seven deaths lay between. The lamb with his fair army doth on Mount Zion stand, and glory, glory dwelleth in Emmanuel's land. O Christ, he is the fountain, the deep, sweet well of love. The streams on earth I've tasted, more deep I'll drink above. There to an ocean fullness, his mercy, mercy doth expand. And glory, glory dwelleth in Emmanuel's land. The bride eyes not her garment, but her dear bridegroom's face. I will not gaze at glory, but on my king of grace. Not at the crown he gifted, but on his pierced hand. The lamb is all the glory of Emmanuel's land. Oh, what, what richness there is. And, and, and there are so many more hymns that you could choose, that you could take with you. And read, or take with you with a couple of people, and sing. Bring hymnals with you 
to the sickbed. Why not? Bring hymnals with you to the hospital. Bring hymnals with you to the, the hospice room. Why not? Or make songbooks that you can bring with you. Some years ago, we had a, a woman in our church who was, she had a lifelong cerebral palsy. And she had lived for someone with that condition a very long life, very limited and, uh, in what she could do. And she was often living near death. She contracted pneumonia. She was put into a nursing home and then put into, into hospice care. And uh, this was around Christmas time. And a bunch of us, she also had MRSA. And a bunch of us went to the hospice and uh, told them what we were going to do. We brought some songbooks with us, uh, Christmas carols. And we had everybody, everybody had to gown up. Everybody had to put on gloves and a mask because of the MRSA. And we went into her room, we surrounded her bed, and we sang Christmas carols that were really heard throughout the place. But we were singing them in the presence of this saint of God who was, we believed, may not survive the week. She did survive the weekend. Her heart was so moved by the singing of Christmas carols that we did, by, by the pointing to the Savior, she not only survived the weekend, she survived the pneumonia. And she was able to actually go home. And she survived a few more months until she died. But but you see what singing can do. Blessed by God. Uh, I'm not saying it's the singing that did that, but the singing was what the Spirit of God used, I believe, to encourage her and to help her to overcome what was taking place. Uh, Bring an iPod, a CD player, something that, that can provide encouraging background music of the hospital or the hospice. Christmas music has, a, or not Christmas music, but Christian music is uplifting to the heart. And when someone is discouraged, when they're, when they're failing, uh, to hear glimpses or to hear just portions uh, can do so much to just lift spirits. That's one way that you can comfort Apparently, you can't comfort by advancing the... Oh, there we go. Whoops, now it went too many times. Whether scripture or song, choose the familiar over the obscure. Uh, When people are fading, their memories are fading, and the deepest memories, the oldest memories of, of things that they have sung, of things that they've heard, these are the things that will resonate with them. If you read an obscure passage of scripture, if you ring, let's sing a song that has no meaning to them, um, it's not going to be helpful. But choose the, the familiar over the obscure. Speak to their fears specifically and honestly. Uh, don't lie. Don't conceal the truth to protect dying people. Don't tell them it's going to be okay uh, when you know it's not going to be okay, at least not in the way that they think it's going to be okay. Ultimately, it's okay in the Lord. But don't give them false hope. Give them true hope. Encourage those who can't visit, physically can't get there, to call. Or if the individual can't take phone calls, to email and have somebody read the email messages and keep it short. A short sentence of encouragement can do a lot. John Newton, Amazing Grace fame, said, When the time shall arrive which he has appointed for your dismission, I make no doubt, but he will overpower all your fears, silence all your enemies, and give you a comfortable, triumphant entrance into his kingdom. You have nothing to fear from death. For Jesus, by dying, has disarmed it of its sting, has perfumed the grave, 
and opened the gates of glory for his believing people. So in conclusion, get up from your comfortable seat. Get out of your office. Get out of your comfort zone. Go where sick and dying people are in their affliction and care for them. And remember that this is an exercise of religion that is pleasing to God our Father. Let's pray. Father, we do thank you for your mercies to us. Uh, we pray that we'll give some consideration to the things we've talked about, that we'll find some ways that we can use some of these things to minister to the people we know and love and to strangers as well, that we may be faithful to you and that we may be the means of drawing others to yourself through Jesus, our Savior. Amen. We've got just a couple minutes if there's a question or two. Well, I, I, think, I think you can always encourage them to fight, but don't give them a false hope. It, it, looks, it looks very serious. It looks like this could be the means that God will use to glorify himself through your passage. And, uh, you know, be prepared for that. But uh, do what you can to, to keep up your health. I think that's legitimate. And if the person comes to a point and says, you know, I, I've tried, I've tried, I'm too weak, I can't, I'm ready, let me go. Don't fight with them. Recognize they, they know something about their body. They know more about their body than you do. And give them that respect and not push, but help them to become, to become as comfortable as they can be. That makes sense. Okay. You could ask her, what do you want? Do you want? Not what your kids want, not what your neighbors want. What do you want? At this point in your life, you've lived a full life. You know the Lord. What is the expectation of the dialysis? What do you hope to accomplish by it? Can it accomplish that? Sometimes when we say by all means possible, She's going to come to that point where she does die. And no one can extend that. So I think it's important to find out from her what is it that you want. And recognizing that I've come to that place in my life where medical means, medical intervention, is not going to significantly improve my quality of life or extend my life. Maybe it's time to let nature, as it were, take its course. And to entrust myself, the care of my soul and my body, to the Lord who made me.
that's hard because we never want to say goodbye. But the truth is we will all say goodbye. You pray for God to be merciful, for God to fulfill his purposes and his will. For God to heal her if he wishes. To, for God to, to draw close to her and bring her gently into his, his arms. These are hard issues. But we have to confront them. And so we have to speak plainly, clearly, without confusion, uh, without using to kind of dance around the issue and don't come right to the heart of the issue. Yeah, and we leave it in your hands. Yes, ma'am. My role is not to tell them what to do. My role is to assist them in any way that I can. Part of that involves making sure that they have accurate information, a good understanding, and, uh, and have considered the alternatives. They, as a family, need to talk about it together. You can, you know, I can assist that in terms of uh, if questions go in a particular direction, I can maybe help to clarify the questions and help to redirect the questions to consider other issues and facilitate it in that way. But ultimately, they need to come to a conclusion. And it needs to be a conclusion that they can own. And you can ask, you know, you can ask for the doctor's counsel, you can ask other people, but ultimately the family has to make that decision. I would. Even if I had reservations about one way or the other, I would be supportive of, of their decision. It's one that they need to make. All right, I think it's... Uh, 220. So we'll call it time and uh, I'll be around for a while if somebody wants to talk. And uh, thank you again so much for, for coming, participating. It's been a pleasure for with you except for altitude acclimation and a cold and a few other things that have gotten in the way. But uh, I, have, uh, I, I have appreciated your attentiveness. I have appreciated the questions that you've raised. And I hope I have been of some help and encouragement to you. That's why I came. And so if you've got more questions, I'm here for that purpose. Thank you.